Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This is for UFC Vegas 78. This episode of the Dogger Pass Podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass Podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Producer Megan on the sticks, Cody Saftik on the line, breaking down UFC Apex fighting. Apex fighting 78. There's some fun fights. I love watching fights, but... It's hard to get up and hard to be like super, super excited for, you know, the the entire collection. There's so many fights going on. Bellator's got a nice little card this weekend. We got contender series on Tuesday nights. Um Yeah. There's there's a few spots here, but like I'm not loving this card, Cody. How do you feel about it? That's kind of how I felt last week. Like, it went down to Nashville, and then I ended up going to the Smoker Show on the Thursday, called the show on the Friday, went to the UFC on Saturday, got smashed on that card. Terrible outing, uh, picking-wise, um, but all around good time. There's just so many fights, and then I came back, and this is a 13-fight card, so I want to jump into it, make sure I got ahead of it. As you mentioned, there's a Bellator on Friday. And so, like, the prospect of going and tape studying the Contender Series guys from last night, I just wasn't up to it. And I'm not going to throw fake picks out there and just be like, I spent five minutes on this, so I just passed all together. But again, if you do the tape study on those properly, plus these 13 fights, that's 18 more fights right there. So it's a constant loop, probably better just to pick and choose your spots. Now, as you mentioned, this card, this card's super fun, like I think entertainment wise, but it, it's very untrustworthy. Lots of underdogs are going to come through. And I think it's kind of a UFC, uh, your job is on the line because you look up and down this card and there's tons of guys on terrible winning, terrible losing streaks, long layoffs. You know, mixed results, and basically the UFC owes them a fight. So they're jamming them onto one card, and uh, we've got to figure out the winning combination. Hundo P, Hundo P. Let's get into the main event. 13 fights. Pitter patter, let's get at her. We got uh, Rafael Dos Anjos taking on Vicente Luque. Minus 120 for, uh, for Rafael Dos Anjos. Luque can be had for plus 100. Pretty much a straight pick him, homie. Who you got? Yeah, so you would never cut Vincente Luque on the simple basis of he's an all-action guy. He's basically in fight of the night every time he competes. He's a fan favorite, this, that, and the other. So you're not going to cut him, even if he loses this fight and moves into a three-fight losing streak. But that's kind of the problem. If he loses this fight, it's a three-fight losing streak. And Paul, he just hasn't looked all that good. Still only 31, 32 years old, but it's the mileage on him. Every time he competes, it's an absolute train wreck of a fight. And again, you look at... Pretty much all of them dating back to the Mike Perry split decision win. It's just a crazy fight. His fight with Brian Barbarain, a crazy fight. His fight with Nico Price, crazy fight. And in the last two against Blah Muhammad and then Jeff Neal in particular, you're seeing that damage starting to really rack up. Now, the two fights back against Blah, very important here because I think Rafael DeSantis is primarily going to try to wrestle him. And that's exactly what Bilal did. But one thing that's important to note, Vincente Luque fights a hard five rounds in that fight. Wins the third round, doesn't really fatigue for the most part, and his get-up game was pretty good. Is that Bilal has infinite cardio and did an excellent job of blending his striking with his grappling. Bilal's a natural welterweight. In fact, pretty good size welterweight. Rafael Desenos isn't. Like he's 38 years old. He's a former lightweight champion, but he's out. I think he's two and five in his last seven fights at 170 pounds, mostly himself getting out grappled. And yeah, he can pull out a performance like he did against Brian Barbarena, where he scores. I think four takedowns over Brian Barbarena and just uh, pretty much stifles him. You know, the Hanato Moicano, but those are smaller guys. Like, Vincente Luque is a welterweight. And again, he got taken down plenty of times versus Bilal, but he keeps forcing his way back up. And when he is standing, Bilal had the chops to beat him up, but I don't think Dos Anjos is going to really beat him for a prolonged period of time. And you've seen Dos Anjos in his last fight, 155 pounds against uh, Rafael Fazeev. He gets knocked out brutally. Like, loses the first three rounds of that fight where he's unable to take down Fazeev who's a natural striker and a lightweight. So again, if he spends three or four rounds struggling to take down Luke, he's going to eat a whole lot of damage. I know Luke is shop worn damaged goods, but he's getting beat up by natural power punchers. Whereas a, a lightweight Dos Anjos at 38 years old, moving up a weight class. Like he, I don't know when was the last time he knocked somebody out? Like long time, long time. So I got to go with Vincente Luque and the plus money. And again, I think that uh, Kill Cliff FC will have him ready. And he'll be working with Gilbert Burns. And he'll be working with the best wrestlers in the camp and this, that, and the other. Like, I'm sure they're getting ready for it. But that's what he's got to do. He's got to sprawl and brawl. And I'd tell him to move his head. But if he hasn't figured out how to do that by this point, probably not going to happen here. Crazy five-round fight. Back and forth. Good exchanges both ways. Luque edges it out. That's what I'd be going with. 
My biggest concern with Luke is what? He had brain hemorrhage in 2022. I don't know. Have you seen the way he fights? Exactly. Just like, I don't know if like, if he was like told by doctors that he shouldn't be fighting, if I want to put money behind it. Um, he has been able, like people have been able to take him down historically. He's got really, really good jujitsu. He's got some great submission skills um, off of his back. Like I think it is a rel- very, very, very close fight, but ever so slightly, I'm going to lean to Javier Dos Anjos, who I think has the better cardio over the course of five rounds, um, who can utilize the wrestling to uh, to mix it up in this fight quite a bit. And, uh, and yeah, to my knowledge, hasn't had any brain hemorrhages. Call me crazy, but I don't really want to put money behind someone with brain hemorrhages in a cage fight. Um, 25-minute cage fight. Crazy, right? It's like a crazy thought. Um, but yeah, I think it, I think the market's pretty pretty accurate here. I'm not you know, like I'm not too too fervent on on either side here. Like I can understand a lot of the points that you made. How Rafael dos Anjos, his wrestling hasn't been as great when he's had to take on like big dudes, 170 pound natural 170 pound dudes. So I get where you're coming from, but I just disagree. Uh, moving on down, we've got Hakeem Dawadu taking on Cub Swanson. Hakeem Dawadu is a minus 210 favorite. Swanson could be had for plus 180. Who you got? Yeah, so this is another fight that seems easy on paper, like Cub Swanson's quote on quote done he's nearing his 40th birthday he's definitely not the guy he used to be and that fight against jonathan martinez was an absolute beatdown. and i do mean that in every sense of the word he lost every part of that fight not in the sense that it wasn't like remotely competitive not in the sense that like he didn't get his own licks in in the sense that he got dropped with a knee to the head then he got dropped with a kick to the body or a knee to the body stung with a kick to the body finally uh folds over due to leg kicks his entire body got wrecked in that fight against Jonathan Martinez, who quite simply just proved to be younger and faster and worked an excellent leg kick game, slowed him down, picked his spots, beat on him. But that's kind of the issue with Cub. He's like a 50-50 fighter at this point. Either he shows up like in the Kron Gracie fight or the Daniel Pineda fight, and he looks good still. He can still grapple. He has a BJJ black belt. He seems to score takedowns in the majority of his fights. Whether he establishes top control or not, that remains to be seen. But guy's got 25-minute cardio, so in a 15-minute fight, he's generally good to go. It's just age and and mileage and so much wear and tear is most definitely caught up to him. And so what you're more expecting out of him these days is like that last performance where he got absolutely picked apart by Jonathan Martinez or I guess three fights back against Giga Chikots where early body kick. Same thing, he's soft to the body, right? Martinez hurt him twice to the body. Giga put him away to the body. Martinez also happened to drop him with the knee to the head and finished him with leg kicks. And it wasn't like leg kick, I'm going to switch stance. It wasn't like leg kick, he fell on his butt. It was like leg kick, he fell in the fetal position. And Martinez kind of like looks around around and smacks him in the head twice and the ref jumps in so his body's hella banged up it's always been banged up but he's magic cup he's always got like that one more performance where he'll come out and he'll pull one off so the underdog money's right on him in terms of he is a big underdog i just don't feel comfortable betting hakeem Dawadu as a big favorite because again he's not i wouldn't call him a 50 50 fighter but paul you know him as well as i do he's very low output at times he'll stand in front of his opponent and then his fight with Michael Trezano is actually the first fight in his UFC career where he actually turned up the volume, turned up the heat, lands like 124 significant strikes, good performance out of him, butchers the leg, which he's going to have to do again here. Looks fine in that performance. The very next performance against Julian Arosa, sizable favorite. Arosa beat the crap out of him. These is two guys coming off bad fights, man. Arosa dropped him three times, wobbled him with pretty much everything he wanted to, took him down at will, took his back at will, and Dewadu had no way to get him off the back. So, so Cubs actually got... Some problems. A prime cub? A cub two years ago? I'm pulling the trigger on this plus money, baby. He can take him down. He's got the wrestling chops to do it. He's got better jiu-jitsu. If he ends up on the back again, I think he could take it. I think he could present present some problems. But Cub's a guy that will throw a lot of volume, throw a lot of pace. Even if his fight with Martinez, he gets smoked. But he got outstruck like 62-52. It's remotely competitive on the numbers. And Hakeem Dewadu, six wins in the UFC. Five of them by decision. The one win was over that, like, Takanori Hori. There was 55 seconds left in the fight. And that guy would not be considered good by any stretch of the imagination. So, Dewan is not a power puncher. He's not a guy that goes out there and finishes people. And Cub, who's a, who's a lame dog, who's just waiting to get put away, you still need a modicum of power or some finishing ability to put him away. If you let him hang, you let him hang in this fight, 
Maybe he pulls off one of his classic cup-like performances where he swings for the fences, he lands big shots, he wows the crowd, he hurts Dewadu a couple times with a couple, you know, off-pace uh, counters that end up landing. The judges want to give one to the old boy because he's a fan favorite, and the very limited crowd of the Apex is probably pro um, Cub Swanson. So, like, could he squeeze one out? I don't know. You'd have to be ballsy. As of the writing of this show, I don't know if I'm going to get there. I'm taking some other underdogs on the card. I'm not puss puss in it here. But on this particular fight, like, do I want a near 40-year-old Cub Swanson been through everything he's been through? I don't know. But for this money line on Hakeem Dewadu, I, I also wouldn't like that. So the name of the show is Dog or Pass. And if you look at it in that perspective, either pass, maybe a little sprinkle on the dog. But Hakeem, I, I'll, again, check out Wayans, check out all that. He's always ripped up. He's always in great shape. He pulled out of a fight two months ago due to injury. Don't know what the injury was. He's 32 years old. He's a low-volume guy at times. This fight just too greasy for my liking. Yeah. At the number. Um, I'm not going to have the cojones to pull the trigger on Cub. Oh. No, I just can't. can't do it. He's almost two years older than me. I'm washed. Um, 145 pounder, almost 40 years old. Performances have been pretty dull. He's had some, yeah, he's got a puncher's ch uh, chance. He's had a puncher's chance for like the last like three or four years in the promotion. But like it, it's pretty ugly when he gets hit hit up too but i don't know what to do with this one to be perfectly honest like dewadu as you meant like if dewadu shows up as he did against uh as he did against trezano maybe takes a little bit of risk by eating some shots yeah, but I it's agree. like i don't know if cubs gonna be able to keep up with dewadu's technique his skill on the feet really really good at muay thai uh is is uh, hakeem dewadu I don't know if he'll be able to keep up with that type of pace, that type of... But it's like if we see what we usually see from Dewadu, which is like 45, 50 significant strikes, that would open up a situation where it's like Cub could get 70 in that type of scenario and then eke out a decision. Or like Cub we have seen dropped a bunch of times, but like... Yeah, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not going to be surprised by very, very many results in this fight. And that's like, I know it's like a super horrible, like when people come here for straight picks and stuff, but it's like, I think the line is very, very accurate. It's like, I would like to bet uh, Dewadu if the price was like, if it was like a 60-40 split, where it was like minus 150 uh, plus 130. It's like, then I would I would easily side with Dewadu, but... Yeah, at, at a 70% clip, which is what they're asking for now. I don't know. I, I see three out of 10 wins for Cub. So I suppose I will select Cub for the purposes of this show. But I have other underdogs that I'm wasting money on this week, Cody. I don't need to force action at Cub Swanson this week. Uh, moving on down, we've got Khalil Roundtree taking on Chris Dawkins. Roundtree, a minus 170 favorite. Dawkins can be had for plus 150. This fight's at 205 pounds. Obviously, weigh-ins are going to be very, very important. I've always kind of thought with Dawkins, you know, I, who am I to judge anybody, right? But it's like, I'm not a pro fighter going in there. But it's like watching him move around the octagon, you're kind of like, well, there looks like there's like, there, there looked like there were 30 pounds to lose. You know what I mean? It's like, he didn't have the biggest frame. He kind of got bullied by some of the bigger, stronger heavyweights. He was always super, super fast on the feet. He's got some power in his hands. And allegedly, he wasn't able to use it at heavyweight because those guys are too damn strong. But it's like he's got some decent grappling. I took him out like plus 182 like two weeks ago. Like basically as soon as the number opened, I was just like, I think he's at least live. Um, if 205 ends up being okay. If he misses weight, I'm going to feel horrible about that bet. Made it long in advance. I can't cash out uh, at that place or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to go with Dawkins. Um, you know, sometimes people move weight classes. It doesn't exactly resurrect their career. But because he was, like, kind of quick at heavyweight on the feet, I feel like this could actually be a pretty good move for him. What do you think? Yeah, and listen, I completely agree. I think it's a good move for him in that he wasn't the biggest heavyweight going. And even though he was a very fast heavyweight, and I think he won his first – Four fights in the UFC all by quick knockout. Like, he looked like he could be okay because he was way faster than them. But they jumped him up, man. They jumped him up heavy. Like, you look at his losses. How could you fault the guy? Loses to Derek Lewis. 
probably one of the top three biggest power punchers the division's ever seen. Then they match him up with Curtis Blades, which is like a not really good comeback fight, man. Takes on Curtis Blades, also gets knocked out. And then they match him up against Yerozino Rosenstruck. This is just not good news for anybody. Bad, bad matchmaking, bad management. And uh, is that what causes you to say, I can't cut it at heavyweight? No, you just can't cut it in the top five at heavyweight. Probably can't cut it in the top 10 at heavyweight to be realistic, but because he'll be a top 15 guy. Moving down to 205 probably allows him to further that, try to take an actual run for him. 205 is a barren wasteland of title contenders. So if he comes in there, beats Khalil Roundtree in an impressive fashion, hopefully moves forward. Now, your brain went exactly where I'm minded on this one. It's like, why doesn't he just take him down? A couple reasons of why doesn't he just take him down. First of all, yeah, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Guy's pretty solid on the ground. Never attempted, not even attempted, one takedown in seven UFC fights. So that's bad news. But also circumstances and some of those fights ended early and some of those fights are good guys. I, I don't know. Just to make an excuse, he's got no history of taking guys down. But still, Paul, your brain went to the same place I did. Even though he's not done it before, why not do it now? Because if this fight hits the ground, he's going to have a very significant advantage. Black belt or not, Khalil Roundtree is just bad on the ground. And the UFC knows this, which is why they've matched him almost exclusively with strikers. He fought Dustin Jacoby, a glory kickboxer, his last time out. Carl Roberson, also a glory kickboxer. Modestus Bukaukas, I don't even really know what he does, but it's mostly striking stuff, right? Marcin Pragnio, a Kyushin karate black belt. That's four straight strikers, exclusive strikers. The one before, that's Ian Kudalaba. Maybe it could be a striker. They took him down four times in two and a half minutes. Full mounted him and absolutely smeshed him, okay? The little round tree's been training in Thailand. I'm sure his striking's good. It's been off a year. If he shows up in decent shape. They probably beat Doukas down the stretch because all of Doukas' fights end within a round, round and a half. I got no confidence in his cardio, even at light heavyweight. Like maybe it's better, but maybe a drastic 40-pound weight cut is also going to leave him as a one-round guy. But he needs to get down Khalil Roundtree, ASAP, get on top of him and put him away. If he does that, certainly a live underdog. If this thing stretches out again, we've seen Roundtree go three rounds with Jacoby. And even though it's so sloppy... um, he can carry some degree of power later on. He lands some okay shots. He's proven that he can go 15, whereas Doukas has not proven that in the slightest bit. So I don't hate the underdog shot on Chris Doukas. He'd have to do something he's never done before. But yeah, if I'm his coaches, and, and you just got knocked out three times, okay? Well, why would you want to fight Khalil Roundtree on the feet? How could this possibly be a good game plan by anybody's standards? Not, not. So you got to think they're thinking, take him down and grapple him, but... I don't know. Sometimes easier said than done. Again, don't hate it, but I think I'm going to edge out Khalil Roundtree and uh, it would be like a good live betting situation. If he does get taken down, he gets beat up. Doukas looks good early, but this thing goes into a second round. Again, I'm just really not confident on on Doukas' ability to cut 40 pounds and then look good down the stretch, but maybe he will. Maybe I'm wrong. He's faster than Roundtree. He's got quicker hands than Roundtree. He's got a, on paper, much better ground game than Roundtree, but that wrestling's still an unknown the down the stretch cardio for him is still an unknown. Uh, so yeah, the plus money. Okay. I don't fault anybody for taking it, but I, personally I'd want a little bit more before I got there. That is fair. I mean, they, they one, one book opened up uh docus by submission at 20 to one and it got smashed. It got smashed all the way down to eight to one. So People are thinking maybe he finally, you know, we see his brother use a ground game. We see his brother, you know, you know, try to submit guys and use jujitsu and stuff like that. They train together every single day, I imagine. Um, So I can understand why people are smiling. There's still a 14 to one out there. Uh, It's not available to me. Oh, I'll be maybe looking for a little sprink, a little sprink to add on top of my money line play. What's the worst that could happen? I mean, his knee could get shattered by one of those front kicks from Khalil. That's definitely, definitely Ooh. in play. Uh, moving on down, we got Yasmin Lucindo taking on a Pollyanna Vienna. Minus 180 for Lucindo, plus 155 for Vienna. Who you got? Yeah, so this is probably your classic uh, women's MMA fight that screws me over this week. But I, I like Lucindo, man. I actually really like Lucindo. I like what she brings to the table. She's super scrappy, very strong, seems to have good speed, good cardio. Everything she throws is a little bit loopy, but she'll throw in combinations, right? So even if the first two will get blocked, something gets through. Uh, ground game seems to be not too bad. Debuts against Yasmin Jerry and was like a very good fight for both of them. Now I understand Jerry Queen ended up getting knocked out in her next fight. And 
some of the shine got taken off her. I get it. But like this was a good fight between good two good fighters. Again, high volume, high output. I thought she did a lot of good work. Um, unfortunately, on the opposite end of a decision. Her next fight against Brogan Walker looks even better. Again, takes her down four times. Controls are pretty much everywhere. Uh decision win. So even though she's throwing those big loopy hooks and she it looks like she's throwing a ton of power maybe doesn't have like that big knockout that big ko that big stopping ability but again i think that it looks good within the judges she's quick she's strong her ground game doesn't look too bad she can go a hard 15 pollyanna vienna she's always kind of been a wild card because like there's the crap that you've been fed by her and there's what you actually see so the crap that you've been fed about her is uh brazilian jiu-jitsu world champion like accredited brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt but then you see her in the ufc Man, she struggled to put it together like a lot. The fight with JJ Aldridge, she took her down, couldn't do anything with it, lost the fight. The fight with Hannah Cyphers, couldn't take her down, got muscled up, got dropped, lost the fight. Bad luck, man. The fight with Veronica Macedo at the time, she's Veronica Hardy now. She scored a takedown because she never really scores much takedowns for the record. Uh, she does score a takedown in that fight right into an armbar from guard. So where's this Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt? Now, if you match her against the lower level, Emily Whitmire, Mallory Martin, Jinyu Freyer last time out, she'll come on top of those fights but her wrestling's just not good i don't think she consistently gets fighters down her fight with tabitha ricci she got taken down five times largely controlled there's another fight where her jiu-jitsu off her back really not all that good and so it's what kind of you know improvements has she made on her feet she knocked out Jinny freyer last fight so maybe she's confident that she can go out there and exchange with lucindo over a prolonged period of time but I think that they're going to exchange. She'll get a couple shots in, and Lucinda's just going to keep coming. She's going to John Lineker. She's going to prime Jessica and Josh because Josh totally washed these days, man. Woof, woof. But like prime version, you know, be aggressive, be on the front foot, back her up. And um, I just don't think that she's ever, Pollyanna Viana will ever be comfortable fighting off her back foot. Therefore, she'll just slowly fall behind on the punch stats. She'll slowly fall behind on the numbers. She's not had any one performance where she's shown you an ability to keep up tick and keep up pace. Whereas with Lucinda, you have. So it really does come down to the takedown. If she can take down Lucindo, maybe she does got a little ace up her back pocket or something. But ah, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. And Lucindo seems very, very strong. So taking her down is going to be a problem. And if you do get her down, chances are she's going to work her way back up. So I know it's minus 200. Women's MMA, going to bite me in the ass. Pat May will always have the last laugh in these situations. But uh, yeah, I got Yasmin Lucindo to get the job done. Uh, the thing I like the most in this fight on prize picks, we got uh, Lucindo with two takedowns. I think she'd be dumb to take her down at all. It's like taking down her, like the, the arm bar has been like one of uh, well, Pollyanna Vienna's most successful, uh, successful yeah, skills. From guard. Right? It's like from guard, grabs the arm, so throw up my triangle uh, attempts as well, but like. The armbar. The armbar from guard. Doesn't this fight have, like, armbar from guard kind of written all over it? Yeah, of um, course it does. Of course it does, Paul. <laughs> So Come it's on. just Come like, on. if Lucindo is smart. I know she she had four takedowns in her last fight. She didn't take down, to my knowledge. Yeah, she had zero takedowns against Yasmin in the fight before that. I think you just win this fight at range with volume. It's like, sure... Uh, Viana had a knockout win over Jin Yu Fry last time out, but like that was kind of like uh, that, that's like an outlier kind of performance. Nobody really saw it come. I actually kind of got screwed on that because I had uh Viana by sub, I got greedy. There was like only 30 points difference, and I could have taken inside the distance and won the bet, but it was like egg on my face, super, super dumb. She gets the first round knockout, but like nobody was really you know touting that, nobody really saw that one coming. Um, Ricci was able to take her down five times, just hang out in that guard. But it's like Lucinda's still super young. I think she'd be pretty like it would not be a smart decision. So I think under two takedowns for Lucindo on prize picks is a decent look if she comes out here and fights smart. Um, maybe it pushes, you know, she gets two takedowns, but is she gonna get three takedowns? And even when they go to the ground, right? If she gets taken down, it's like I don't think Viana's going to be in a hurry to get back up, right? She may just be like, oh, yeah, okay, we can hang out down here. Like, this is kind of where I want the fight to take place. So I thought two takedowns on Lucindo seemed a little bit off. Um, and then otherwise, um, for the purpose of this show, CF.model told me uh, 
Yeah, armbar from guard very much in play. So Viana by sub or Viana inside the distance would be my official pick. But I don't know if I'm going to actually bet it. Um, I, I understand a lot of the points that you made. The most significant strikes that uh, Viana ever had was against uh, Boomhauer, also known as Hannah Cyphers. And it was a split decision win that she had there. Um, she was knocked down by Hannah Cyphers, and it was 77 to 67. It's just like Lucindo has shown us in that Yoriki uh, fight that like her, like her stand-up game is way, way more advanced than what we've seen from, from Viana. I think Viana's made some big improvements. Um, I mean, at least in terms of power, being able to knock out Jin Yufrey in the first round. But uh, you know what? Otherwise, I'll leave you with otherwise, thing, yeah, I, I, I think this takes place on the feet. Lucindo's got a minder P's and Q's. Don't even go for takedowns. Just hang out at range. Have the same fight that you had against Wariki against Viana, and you'll win this fight. But uh, you know, CF dot model is definitely in play. So that will be my official pick. But I don't think I'm gonna. I don't. I'm not gonna be able to pull the trigger. Yeah, that's fair. The only two things I was going to add was actually she, it was a split decision loss to Hannah Seifer. has got to keep that yeah. one in mind. And also, I think I'm thinking the same thing. I'm like, not say that. Oh, it doesn't matter. I thought you said split decision win, but um, it doesn't matter. The main I mean, thing is a loss to Hannah Seifer is ne never going to age well. But uh, I'm thinking, okay, you know what, Viana, 31, coming off her first knockout win. Maybe she has been working the hands. Maybe she has been spending some time stateside. Maybe she got out of Tata fight team for a little bit in Brazil. So I decided to creep the insta glad i did but she's yeah. not up to much she's not up to much that seems oh that's a great follow she's up Go to a lot Cody. But, uh, she's up to a lot she's got a better and thing going than her fight for game me to bet her in an MMA. does she ever do so yeah, i'm sure the, the only fans manny pays better than the ufc manny but um, but yeah i wish her all the best if good my for her for you the column on Twitter teaches me anything. You get a lot of customers for the OnlyFans monies by infiltrating the MMA gambling space or the MMA uh, fan space. I will say That's that. True. So That's you got well, um, to, all this to adds get up the to fans to get their attention to get them to the find team. your OnlyFans. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta throw some nucks, I guess. Um, moving on down, we got Tafan and Chukwi taking on AJ Dobson. Tafan, the Don, is a minus 145 favorite. Dobson could be had for plus 125. Who you got? I'm gonna go with the slight underdog pick on AJ Dobson. I'm not a Tafan and Chukwi fan, first and foremost, and I'll tell you he's 28 years old. I don't believe it. There's no way that guy's 28 years old. Closer to 38 years old would be my guess, but all the same. He's competed at heavyweight. He's competed at 205. He's competed at, I guess, 185 pounds. And the main thing at all three weight classes is he's so slow, man. Like a stick in mud. Slow. Now he is an absolute tank of a man. Very heavily muscular. You would think he's got some legit power, although he really doesn't have all that much power. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to like gain ground against him. If you, if you try to back him up, and you know, he, he's not fast enough to fight off his back foot, so he's not going to back up. And then you run into a wall of a man. But guys just matador him from the outside. Some guys are hesitant to engage with him because, again, he seems to be menacing. But I'm not really seeing it out of him, man. And honestly, because I don't think he's 28 years old, I think he's older, I think he's just getting slower, if anything. You look at his fight on the Contender Series versus Al Montalvo, where he folded him over with a head kick midway through the second round. It's a nice highlight, but important to note, Montavo's out striking him 55 to 47. Al Montavo is out striking him on the numbers because he throws up fairly low volume. And again, he's just a very hittable guy. His fight with Jamie Pickett, that's his outlier. He lands 120 significant strikes on Jamie Pickett. He scored a knockdown. Fight did go to decision, but that's that one performance where you could look at and say, geez, he did put some numbers up there. The Jungian Park fight, terrible fight, okay? Uh, goes 15 minutes. He lands 58, got taken down twice, almost got sub subbed a couple times. Awful. The Mike Rodriguez fight, yeah, he put up 116 there, but it's three rounds of him just clinging on to Mike Rodriguez. Slow Mike, a guy that had virtually no success in the UFC, so don't take too much away from it. But then it's those last two, like the Asma Merzikhanov fight. I remember having a bunch of money on Merzikhanov and being down two rounds. I remember being down two rounds, and then Merzikhanov knocks him out in the third. But watching it back, it's like, yeah, probably down two rounds. But it's all Merzikhanov's fault. He's just not throwing either. It's a terrible fight. That fight is no good through the first 10 minutes. Both of them are gun-shy standing at each other. But again, whenever 
Zakhanov does let his hands go in those first two, he lands. I mean, Njikwi just mostly puts up a high guard, doesn't really move his feet, there to get hit. And you get the impression that like a decent striker, someone who's fast, is just going to absolutely starch him. And then that's what happens in his last performance. Carlos Solberg absolutely knocks him out. So it's been off a year. He's 33 years old. I don't see him getting, or sorry, he's 28 years old, but whatever. I've already mentioned that part of it. I just don't see him making those improvements that are key. The other thing is the bouncing around of weight classes, right? He fought Carlos Ulberg at 205, uh, coming in at 206 pounds. He fought Mirza Khanov at 205. He fought Mike Rodriguez at 205. He fought Jung Yun Park at middleweight. And he lost that fight and looked absolutely awful and barely threw anything at all. So now because he's lost his last two fights at light heavyweight, he's just going to come back down to 85. He's just going to cut an extra 20 pounds off that super muscular frame. He better hope he lands something and knocks him out quick. And then the last time he's knocked out anybody was Almontavo, and that was three years ago. So I'm not sold on him in the slightest sense of the word. He's pulled out of a couple fights due to injury. There is a layoff there. Him as a betting favorite, not getting behind it whatsoever. Now we go to AJ Dobson, because it's not about just fading one guy you don't like. You got to at least have something on the other side, right? That's a big lesson I've learned over time. And it's like, not like AJ Dobson's great, but... He is just the much younger, greener fighter. Like, he comes from a a scene in Ohio where he had basically wrecked a lot of low-level guys. His head coach is Matt Brown. Mark Coleman's in the gym. He's got a couple decent training partners, but he's very green. Now, he used to be a power lifter, very physically strong, and he's fast. He's a fast, strong, explosive guy. They debut him off. He wins on the Contender Series. Beat a bum, in my opinion, but the guy was 6-0 at the time, so whatever. But but wins on the Contender Series, gets the contract, debuts against Jacob Malcolm. Terrible fight, because Jacob Malcolm's probably one of the best, I wouldn't say wrestlers, but takedown artists. Jacob Malcolm takes down everybody at will. And although Dobson was very physically strong and had some spots, it's just a bad matchup, and he got swarmed on. Then his next fight with Armin Petrosian, again, I thought he looked much better. Here's a guy that's clearly making improvements between camps. Here's a guy that's getting more experience, getting more season, only second fight in the UFC. It's just it's a terrible fight. Arun Petrosian is an absolute killer. He throws up 100 significant strikes on the reg reg, right? He kicks for days, never gets tired, cast iron chin. And even though Dobson busts up his face pretty good, Petrosian just pulls away on him. So tough spot. He took Petrosian down a couple times and i like what i see out of him i think he's faster than jacqui i think he's equally as strong as in jacqui and i think where is in jacqui is kind of stagnant not really making getting all that better dobson's still on the up and up right 31 he's not young he's not old but uh because he was green getting into mma you're gonna see this guy probably peak at 33 34 whereas most guys are on the on the downswing and uh yeah yeah plus money on dobson whatever i would take it i think he's got the speed advantage works him from the outside maybe mixes in a couple takedowns it's his coming up party and tafana jacqui gets cut from the ufc that's how i see this one going what if i were to tell you that tafan and jacqui is like three years younger than dobson yeah, on paper, he's, he's 28 dollars and paper. 31. I get that. Bro, there's what no is way, it? man. Oh, I see this there's all no the time. way. I see he this says. all the time. I see this all the time. This is Mostly like in Russia. This is like but, uh Gadzimarad. Gadzimarad anti Gulov was 37, you're saying. Yeah, well, some that of those guys of... were like super old. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let is me that just, what you're let saying me just about Tafan? Because he is younger, and you like a lot of your argument there seemed to yeah. be that like that Tafan is is like you know he's he's a little bit longer in the tooth in this or in terms of like mm-hmm. his career. But like I mm-hmm. I mean he hasn't had that many fights. Um, I just don't understand where you're coming from there. Like it doesn't really make any sense to me. Uh, okay, I would say his physical appearance is of a much older man. His reflexes and his athleticism seems of a much older man. He's physically fit. Don't get me wrong. I'm just not buying into it. And with the Russian fighters, what would happen is you're a 38-year-old Russian fighter and the UFC is not looking to sign you because you're old. So what happens is you forge your documents. You say you're a 31-year-old Russian fighter. And then all of a sudden, oh, man, this guy's 14-2. and two. They bring you in. You don't get the opportunity otherwise. And again, this is very commonplace, not only in places like uh, Cameroon. It's very popular. That's where Tafana Jaqui is actually from. Very popular in Russia. But even here in Canada, Adrian Woolley is in his 50s. He's a police chief in Canada, fought MMA. Tried to get to the UFC. They had told me he was too old. He forced his sure dog stuff to say that he's 10 years younger. Every tale, ta- uh, tale of the tape this guy had had him listed as almost 10 years 
younger. Simple fact that you don't see one to have even had to sniff this guy's way had they known his real age. You do see it. Kamal Shalarus from Iran, okay? He's like 42 in the UFC. He's like, yo, dog, I'm actually about 32. I had a brother that died, and my parents gave me his birth certificate because they didn't want to pay the money to register a second child. So it happens all over. And in the case of why is Cameroon a hotbed for that? Because oftentimes when you're trying to get out of the salt mines, you're trying to get out of the situation, you're trying to get out, you file for these visas. And they don't look to take middle-aged men. They're looking to take that younger crowd, give them an opportunity, not somebody that's lived there their entire lives. So you you could very well be uh, 30 years old and you tell them that you're 20 years old and they take you. Now all of a sudden you're actually 40 but your paperwork says you're 30 and i can't give out his name because i i fully understand but there's currently a fighter in canada from afghanistan uh fighting as a 29 year old man okay in actuality he's a 21 year old man when i asked him i was like this is going to screw your chances of trying to get to a bigger promotion they're like he's here on somebody else's visa right he went to the thing they kind of looked alike they brought him in and now if he was to say that's not really my age, then that would mean the paperwork that he submitted with the embassy and the Canadian government is also not valid. And then you run the risk of getting deported. So better to just let people think he's a lot older. They'll think he's a Yul Romero type that fights into his 40s. It happens all of the time. So it's not like I'm just throwing this out there to be uh, ignorant jerk. And I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying there's incredible basis for what I'm saying. And, uh, Tofan will probably go out there and murder him in the first round and make me look like a clown. But we're here to give picks. We're here to give predictions. This is how I feel about it. Yeah, I think this fight really comes down to... It, nobody's really tried to take Tofan down, and Dobson showed that he's got a little bit of grappling skills last time out. And then you kind of go forward towards Ar Armin Petroj, like, you know, being able to take down Armin, keep it relatively competitive. He kind of showed a new wrinkle in his game working with Matt Brown and all of those guys that he is still developing, even though he's 31 years old. Um, I mean, Tafon trains with Lloyd Irvin, but it's like I haven't seen any real, like, submission skills from him. He seems like a pretty f slow, methodical striker. I originally kind of liked... His move to 185, I thought he was just going to be way too strong for everybody, but it kind of turned out that he was just way too slow to fight at 185 pounds. So I'm actually picking the underdog, uh, AJ Dobson, with you. Um, but yeah, weigh-ins are going to be kind of huge for this one. Like I like Dobson even more, and we'll probably bet him if it looks if Tafan either misses weight or like looks like death, which is very very much in play. I would say on Friday morning. So keep an eye out for weigh-ins. Uh, Dobson will be the pick right now. Dobson will definitely be a bet if I see something uh, sketchy at uh, Friday's weigh-ins. Moving on down, we've got Josh Fremd taking on Jamie Pickett. Fremd is a minus 350 favorite, Cody. Pickett can be had for plus 280. I mean, at what price, Cody? Do you mm, just yeah, plug your nose and take Pickett? I don't know if it's enough yet. I don't know if it's enough for me. But it's like, I, from what I've seen from Friend, and he's made some improvements. I was even on him, um, what, like last time out, I believe? Who was he fighting last time out? Last time out was against, Dumas. yeah, it was against Dumas. And I took him. <coughs> I, go, I was calling, you know, Cendric dumbass. And, um, and then I ended up following up and betting Dumas. So it's like I've had a pretty uh, half decent read on this guy. I was dead wrong on the Tushan Gore fight, actually. No, uh, we'll completely scrapped that one altogether. Um, really didn't see him gain the submission against Gore. I don't know. This is, uh, I mean, in no world am I playing friend minus 350. It's just whether I have the cojones to pull the trigger on somebody like Pickett who has really not shown us very much in the UFC, particularly lately. Um, he can be a pretty tough out. He can have competitive fights against a lower level of competition. I kind of argue that maybe this is the lower level of competition. So the plus 280s or plus 300s maybe out there, they're enticing. I'm not going to lie, Cody. What do you think about this fight? Yeah, this could very well be my, this week's for me, my uh, Ludovic Klein, Ignacio Bahamandes. Like, all signs point towards Josh Shredden to get the job done. The price is relatively the same, and then it's actually probably a closer on paper, greasy-type fight that 
the underdog comes through and costs me a bunch of money. So why do I like Josh Graham? I actually do like this guy. Before he came to the UFC, he won some credible fights on the regional scene. He was a solid enough talent. And then he makes his debut on like three or four days notice against Fluffy Hernandez. Now, when you comparatively to what Fluffy's done to the rest of the guys since Josh Graham, he did pretty good, man. He gave him some type of go, maybe stole the second round, got a takedown, and was able to get back up a whole lot. So even though the Fluffy was a better wrestler, best, better grappler, there's something there for Fram. Again, he's a fairly athletic guy. He was a two-sport athlete in high school, wrestled, played baseball, wrestled collegiately at the university, Slippery Rock University. But all the same, got some collegiate wrestling experience under him. And then he moves over to Colorado. He's at Factory X Muay Thai with uh, Mark Montoya. His cardio seems to be pretty solid. So I fall into the same trap. Even though he lost to Hernandez, I thought he looked good. And same thing as you. I'm, I'm in on this guy on Trejan Gore. In the first round, he looked good. He beats Trejan Gore in the first round. Outstrengths him. Everything's looking like it's coming together. The second round, he got snacked up in this, like, power guillotine. You'd have to watch the fight. I can't really describe the position, but... It was like a really weird guillotine choke. Frem's got nowhere to go. He tried to like run up the cage wall just to alleviate any type of pressure and got caught. Like that's MMA. Get caught by a punch. Get caught by a crazy thing. The things do happen. Drowning is Trejan Gore. Unfortunately, just slipped up and made a mistake. So to see him come out against Cedric Dumas and kind of put it together, Dumas seemed faster, had better striking than Frem, but Frem's got fairly high ring IQ. He picked and chose his spots. He's able to score takedowns when he needed to. And then the finishing sequence is actually crazy. He's getting submitted, pops out of it, rolls on top, grabs the guillotine choke, and puts Dumas away. So uh, again, good cardio, a guy that could maybe get into put some bad spots, but is going to keep scrapping his way back up and overall just put a fight together. So I like him. I just don't really like him at, you know, minus 250 range, that, that two to one range simply because he's a young fighter who is one and two in the UFC and more of a generalist. His wrestling, good, but not great. His striking, I wouldn't even call it good, but work in progress. His cardio is good. Cardio is good. Durability, yeah, I got caught in a guillotine choke. Whatever. Guy went rounds with Fluffy Hernandez. Durability's probably pretty okay. It's uh, it's the Jamie Pickett thing. I just don't think we could get behind him. Here's a guy that's job is very much on the line. He's lost three straight fights in the UFC. He might be the only guy uh, to be on Dana White's contender series three times. Lost his first two fights on the contender series, and they somehow still brought him back. Gave him a contract out of pity, and then again, the, the results aren't there, but <clears throat> uh, three fights ago, Kyle Dawkins it's the takedowns. Takes him down, some subs him like nothing. Dennis Tulin, Dennis Tulin absolutely just beat him, dropped him twice, backed him up, all of his power shots. And then against Bo Nickel, whatever. Don't even waste your time taping that one. It just gets ragged all to the ground, as expected. But against Josh Fram, I think Josh Fram probably does have a wrestling advantage over him. Could take him down if you want to. Submission advantage, yeah, potentially. I think he's got a cardio advantage over him. Pickett's cardio is actually not that bad. So the cardio advantage just might nullify itself. But what he likes to do is mostly just clinch control up against the cage. Any type of success he's had, Joseph Holmes, Leonardo Staropoli, his two wins in the UFC, both of them almost exclusively cage control, racks up short distance strikes from a closed in position. That worked against two awful competitors, but against Josh Frem, who probably has that slight grappling advantage, wrestling advantage, I just don't think he's going to be able to span the takedown. So he's going to need to bring his lunchbox, throw up plenty of strikes, and figure out a way to keep active. And for the price, not going to lie. Somewhat tempting. I think you said it best yourself. Plug your nose and jump on in. Mm. That I'm not going to get there on a personal level. Like, I get it. We can talk up these underdogs. We we realize they have viable chances. But at the end of the day, you know, I can't just feed people every single underdog on the card and suggest it's a great idea. These are the ones I feel comfortable with. These are the ones I don't feel comfortable with. In this particular spot, wouldn't feel comfortable with Jamie Pickett as an underdog. So the pick is Josh Brown. Yeah, I don't have... I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with, with Pickett, to be perfectly honest. Like, knocked out in the first round by Jordan Wright. Like, I mean, the the wins on, like, Joseph Holmes, in my opinion, is, like, the worst guy at, like, 185 pounds right now. Um, So there, there's his win, and that was, like, that was a very close fight. 50 to 51 in significant strikes. Uh, He got two takedowns, and that's what, like, edged out the fight. Like, he's just... He's just slightly scraping the bottom of the barrel to, to, to keep his job. And obviously, after the Bo Nickel fight, they were like, well, we can't, you know, we basically forced you to take this one. Usually, if you lose three straight, you're gone. But it's like, they basically forced you to take Bo Nickel. They knew that you were the sacrificial lamb in that situation. So he's getting, you know, after three fight, or three fight losing streak, 
he's getting another chance here. But yeah, Fram just showed enough in like submission skills, at least when he's able to get a dominant position. That yeah, Fram Fram probably by sub is is how I would see this one shaking out. Um, so yeah, not taking the shot on Pickett. While like when I first was looking at it, I was like, it's tempting, but it's like the more you dig into it, it's just like Pickett just doesn't belong around here. Uh, moving on down, we've got Marcus McGee taking on a JP buys minus three fifty for McGee, plus two eighty for Bays. Bays buys. All I know is the lead stole his girl. Um, and this is a bant- bantamweight fight. McGee fought at one forty five last time. He didn't look too out of out of place, to be per- perfectly honest. Obviously. He had a great performance, but like his size, like he's and buys used to fight at 125 pounds. I don't know. Like here's another spot where you know me, I love underdogs, but it's like I'm kind of leaning towards the big fave here, just in terms of like size, strength, and ability from what we've seen in a small sample size. Um yeah, I, think, I don't know if I really love 135 pounds for JP. So, McGee will be the pick. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. So, uh, Maniac McGee, shout out. Did they make you read that book in school? I mean, let's read it. Really never good heard book. Of it. But anyways, never heard of it. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Probably like a really lesser known book. But anyways, I, I thought it was cool that his name is Maniac McGee. 33 years old, <clears throat> but one of these guys that like earned it, earned it the hard way. So I would prefer to bet on 33 year old veterans who fought decent competition outside of the UFC than I do these debuting 23 year old veterans who have fought in a bunch of guys and may or may not have a, a nice looking record. So McGee's actually done it the hard way. I think he's super tough, man. He's out of the MMA lab. He's a training partner of Sean O'Malley. And the word on the wire is in the gym is that he's like, very very hard working in the gym all the time busts his ass and as a result they offered him that journey nuisance fight in like 48 hours he took the fight on like two days notice and it did look like he was slowing down like ever so slightly but yeah that's because one he came to a fight he brought the pain to jeremy uh, to journey early backs him up south pond stance nice little left hand good little leg kicks very fast even for a 33 year old bantamweight i know the fight was at 140 just because of the nature of the two days notice like what they really expect out of him but Got some speed, got some power, and a guy that's not shot for him. Like, he only has, this is his 10th pro fight. So even though he's 33, doesn't have a ton of mileage. Yeah, trains with great guys, probably been in some gym wars, but I think that he's just, like, a more mature, thought-out fighter, looks physically strong, takedown defense looks solid against Journey Newsom, uh, ends up submitting him in the second round. Like, if you thought he was tired, he definitely pulled out that second gear and scored as an underdog. Gets his gets a bonus, 50k. And I'm thinking he bought a Rolex watch. Like this guy's a cool guy. This is his whole life. He's been busting his ass. And now he's presented with the moment. He takes it, he seizes it, he capitalizes it. Now he gets a full camp and he gets to come down to his natural 135 pounds from 140. Yeah, I I, I would think all good stuff for him. Buys, meanwhile, he's just like a lost man because he's known as this like South African Olympic alternate type wrestling, very, very high level. When you watch tape on him, his chain wrestling's dope. I mean, he'll just from move from one thing to the other, generally gets his man very fast. Uh, seems like a decent enough guy. The results just aren't there, Paul. The results have actually never been there. So fights on the contender series against Joby Sanchez, big favorite. First round looks every bit of a big favorite. Second round just absolutely gasses out. And that once he gasses out, the first sign of adversity, he packs it up, man. Ends up getting knocked out second round by Joby Sanchez. Wins the fight over Jacob Silva. First round guillotine choke. Fight's done. First round. Done. That's what he likes. Quick as possible. Then he gets signed to the UFC, and it's been all downhill since then. Bruno Silva, a flyweight, knocks him down three times. Three scored knockdowns, and then KOs him in the second round. Montel Jackson, the fight actually went the distance. Four recorded knockdowns. Every time he touches him, he put him down. And Baez would try to build some momentum. He'd get floored. He'd work his way back up. He'd survive for a minute. And then he'd seemingly seem like he was starting to get a little bit of confidence, try to throw more than one or two punches at a time, just get countered and get dropped again. Chin's not there. That fight's at 135. And Montal is a big band. I'm like, don't get me wrong. But you can see that one man is a flyweight and one guy's a bantamweight. So he says, screw it. I got to get back down to 125. Goes down to 125. And Cody Durden, who... All the credit to him. I've been putting some disrespect on his name, but he just continues to go out there and thrive and put on good performances. Um, 
But Durden just blasts him out of there early in the first round. So it, can he not take a punch because of the weight cuts to 25? Can he not take a punch because his chin's not very good? But it's important to note that like when he gets hit, there's not a lot of him working his way back into the fight. Like he, he doesn't seem to be all that durable. Now, how does he win a fight with McGee? Well, again, he's probably the better wrestler. Certainly is on paper. But I would think with Marcus McGee, who trains out of a camp full of good wrestlers, to take him down constantly, you'd have to be able to do this for 15 full minutes. I don't think Baez can. He likes to win snappy or lose fairly snappy. And M Maniac McGee's just, again, he's a tough, rugged, 33-year-old 33, 33 veteran sparring partner to the stars who's rugged and got a chip on his shoulder. And probably if he does get taken down early, makes him work, gets back up to his feet, better striker, more power, clips him at some point, knocks him out would be how I would see it. That's the logical take on it. McGee clips him at some point and knocks him out. Um, I see some people taking that shot on JP buys because he's a big underdog because he's got that perceived wrestling advantage. My only counter to that was like, even with the wrestling advantage, wrestling is tiring. He had the wrestling advantage over pretty much all of his opponents, shoots a couple takedowns, gases out. All of a sudden he's got a strike, gets hit, topples over bad recipe man bad recipe so we've talked about other guys who certainly their jobs are on the line jp's job is on the line if that motivates him to come out and do great things then good on him but if you creep his social media it's like oh he's in great shape oh man he's putting real good work in with ode osborne it's like about how did that work out for ode osborne right um anyways move on from this one i just i personally again can't get behind jp buys yeah not plus money not good enough for me gotta go with maniac McGee. Moving up weight classes with a game plan to wrestle, is, it never works out. Like, especially if you have cardio yeah. issues. It's like now you're pushing yeah. around another 15, 20 pounds on, on fight night than, than you're used to. So maybe the weight cut was really depleting him, but in most cases, it's like they have lots of weight classes in wrestling for a damn good reason. It's just like even the smallest differences, like, you know, the average person, like, 15 20 pounds between you know in shape people you may not notice like just by looking at them but it's like physically it it, it definitely matters in there there's there's weight classes for a reason um uh, moving on down we've got uh terrence mckinney taking on mike breeden mckinney a minus minus 280 favorite breeding could be had for plus 220 i mean I've already been scouting. I've been scouting at Cody. You know me. Just like breeding too. Whatever. It's like that's, that's definitely sprinkle worthy. Just like well, how many, like, I mean, the last two two fights it's happened. Obviously, Dober was able to knock him out. After two and a half minutes into the fight, uh, Terrence kind of, you know, gassed out. I think it more likely than not, Terrence McKinney comes out here, whether he wants to wrestle or whether he just wants to throw hands and and finishes them out. But, like, that's already, like, minus 150, minus 175 in some spots. It's like McKinney round one is, like, sufficiently juiced. When this guy first snuck into the UFC, we were able to, like, get under one and a half, so under two and a half so at, like, reasonable prices. It's, like, minus 300 to the under one and a half now. It's, like, the books have caught up. They know what this guy's all about. Um, I think it's, like, find... An amount of money you don't care about ever miss or uh, about losing, and you put it on breed in round two at like twelve to one. Um, I see out there more books are gonna open it up. Hasn't moved yet. Maybe we'll be able to get like a fifteen to one. Like that's how I'm approaching every Terrence McKinney fight um, moving forward. Like from a betting perspective, do I think McKinney wins? Sure, but like that's why uh, you know picks versus bets and like what's What's the best way to go about it? It's like I'm not I'm I'm more thinking like long term. It's just like, and it worked out obviously against Sadikov last time out there. And Sadikov's way better than Mike Breeden. Don't get me wrong, uh, but yeah, that was like plus five seventy five. This one's plus twelve hundred, maybe even more when other books open up. It's like over the long term, if you bet Terrence McKinney's opponent. Either you wait until live if you want to play it a little bit more safe, or you play Terrence McKinney's opponent in round two. You're you're going to do well uh, long term because yeah, I remember on like a previous episode you were talking about like what's with all these guys, um, you know, Court McGee and uh, and and some other guys that like had previously died and had tons of cardio. 
Well, like, you know who does not fit that bill? Somebody reached out in, into DMs. They'll remain nameless because they would prefer to be nameless. But I remember, like, after you said that on whatever episode that was, they were just like, Cody's model doesn't really factor in Terrence McKinney. I'm like, you're damn right. Now, I haven't told you about that until now. But, like, I mean, the guy's, a top, the guy's a top 10 foot. Uh, a drug overdose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, something. something. Holy he was, like, shit. medically dead for, for, for a moment. But, um, oh, wow. yeah, the okay. guy's a top 10 fighter for about two and a half minutes. And then he's like fringe top 20. And then after five minutes of fighting, the guy's like lucky to break top 100. Like how many times do we have to see it? It's like he's a five minute fighter. They should start an organization with five minute fights and maybe he'd have some success there. Even when he's tried to slow things down, tried to control in the wrestling and stuff like that, he still doesn't like he can't throw hands crazy with if he doesn't knock you out in the first round. He's cooked. You can't grapple for more than five minutes. He's cooked. It's like, and then now it's like a quick turnaround after getting finished in round two. I think he probably wins in round one, but it's like, so do the books. So do all the numbers. Breed in round two is a, you know, throw a little sprinkle and, uh, and hope for the best type of play of the week, I think. Yeah, so I'm gonna probably sound super repetitive here, but like I'm I, I'm gonna echo pretty much everything you said, dude. Oh I my actually God. agree. Yeah, I know. So like Terrence McKinney should absolutely smoke him, right? Should smoke him way faster, way stronger, fought a high level of a way better level of competition. <clears throat> and and yeah, if you look what happened, Mike Breeden versus uh Alexander Hernandez, yeah, it probably similar fashion here. McKinney gets the jump on him, McKinney puts him away. Even that last fight against Sadikov, at least he took us back early in the first round, body triangle. Full control of the first round, then he gasses. That's the problem with him. He gasses. He always gasses. On the regional scene, he gassed. On the contender series, when he had fought in like Sean Woodson, he gassed. In the UFC, he either just smokes you out of there very quickly or he gasses. So, how could you ever bet a guy like that <laughs> three to one? You can't. You can't. Now, to make matters worse, right? If you're a McKinney backer, he's taking the fight on a month's notice. Like, not even a month's notice. He's taking the fight, I think, on like two weeks' notice, but he fought a month ago. It's actually mm-hmm. less than a month ago. It was like 27 days ago. He fights. Wins the first round. Gasses out after one singular round. And then gets choked out. Presumably goes back and sits on the couch for a week. I'm sure maybe he gets in the gym. Does some light aerobics, light cardio. Keeps loose. And then when, when Breeden needs an opponent, it's just like, oh, that guy's no good. He's 0-2 in the UFC. Natan Levy took him down eight times, so I know my wrestling's better and I could take him down. Alexander Hernandez smoked him out in a minute 37. So I, I know I could knock him out within a wrestle. Yeah, it looks good, but it's like false confidence, dog. It's false confidence. You're not in shape. You just gassed out 27 days ago. I don't know what you've done to magically make this cardio better, but taking a final short notice is never the answer. So yeah, he's super talented, super explosive, but he needs to get this thing done in one round. Great live betting opportunity on Breeden because not only can you get good plus money right now, but if he just survives the first round, even if he gets beat up the first round, doesn't matter. If he can get out of it, I think he starts to turn the favor, uh, the tide in his favor. So with McKinney, again, on the regional scene, he looks like a minute man. Then he decides he's going to get some training time with Diana Belbita. What, what, what? We're on the wire? Still a minute man. <laughs> then you see him in the UFC. He tries to pace himself. Well, it d- doesn't work either. The bomb team fight, he still manages to gas out and get knocked out. All bad shit. Now, I said earlier on the show, just because you think you can fade one guy, you still got to like the other side. So, like, Breeden has to bring something to the table. And to the naked eye, he really doesn't bring much to the table. However, this is what he does bring. If you remember on the contender series against Anthony Romero, mm-hmm. Anthony Romero was a legit Canadian prospect, undefeated at the time, was supposed to get signed to the UFC, dominates him for the first two rounds, looks like a million bucks. And in the third round, Mike Breeden gives him a hell of a go. Maybe steals back that third round. Enough so that Dana doesn't decide to sign Romero and says, yeah, this kid didn't really look all that good. It's because it was hard to look good against Breeden that gave him a go. Now, Alex Hernandez smokes him out in the first round. He took the fight on short notice. He wasn't in great shape, and he got knocked out by a good version of a a Terrence McKinney-type fighter. You know, either Hernandez is a great fighter or he's atrocious, but uh, again, the kind of fight that you could potentially lose. But then you go to that uh, Natan Levy fight. Keep this in mind, right? First round, he gets taken down by Levy, works his way back up, doesn't accept any position, loses the fight of the first round. Second round, much of the same, only he outstrikes him 23-21 to in the second round, scrambles back up, 
mixes in some takedowns of his own. So this is a close fight. In the third round, Mike Breeden lands 62 of 120 significant strikes. To put things into perspective, he had landed 19 in the first round, 23 in the second round. He lands 62 of 120 significant strikes in the third round. His cardio is there. His desire is there. You said you won't think two second round. I'd hate for you to lose this prop on third round. Because I'm thinking third round. I think McKinney takes him down in the first, grinds on him. Second round, starts to look like a deer in the headlights, but maybe escapes off his back foot. And the third round, when he's too tired anymore, Breeden's going to come on like a man possessed. So another guy whose job's probably on the line. UFC is not really going to stay in the business of Mike Breeden if he loses this. He's been off for 16 months. He's not young by any stretch of the imagination. But whereas I passed on the two other sizable underdogs that looked okay earlier in the card, this is MMA, baby. You got to take a spot here and there. So like, my heart, ah, my head tells me Terrence Bikini is going to flush Royale him in the first round. This thing will be over. My heart tells me Mike Breeden's going to survive that first and bring it back on and score as a sizable underdog. But instead of betting it pre-fight, bet it after the first round, I think is your best bet. Or like Paul says, chase the second or third round. Even put a sprinkle on second or third round. But um, everything you said, I, I actually do agree with. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's not... Yeah, it's not rocket science at this point. It's like McKinney. I mean, the books set the market the exact way. It's like they're like 60% of the time he's going to kill him in the first round. It's like that's basically what they're saying right now. It's just like anything that happens after those first five minutes is like is open for interpretation. Um, so, yeah, I think I think he's definitely alive. And I, I rarely ever do like the round two and three. Like you can totally do it. Um, like He's like 12 to one. In round two, 14 to one. I just hate it's like if you're dead wrong and McKinney wins in round one, it's like, you know, well, you just lost two bets instead of one. But uh, a lot of people That's do it. That's why you bet McKinney a lot of people first do it round I knockout. I don't hate on you it. You bet McKinney first round knockout or Braden second or third round. Because if you got 15 to one on a Braden second round, you'd get 20 to one theoretically. If you were going to get 15, you should get 20 on the third round prop. Uh, you get like a 20 to one on the third round prop and then McKinney first round knockout probably don't pay all that good. But if all you right. did win, it would cover your other losing bets, right? Well, let's say you are a, a hundred dollar unit better, right? So $150 at minus 150 for McKinney to win in round one would win you a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went minus 150. I would go with the knockout. I don't see the submission. I guess he's got a submission game to him, but actually this fight's starting to get greasier and greasier the more I think about it. I think I would just chase that breed and plus money after yeah. the first round. That's what or, I'm saying. Like, like you yeah. said, put a little lunch money on a crazy prop you, just for the you, hell of it. You chase the long prop, and if he gets finished in the first round, well, it's well you were well prepared for it. You're not putting your freaking mortgage right. on breed in round two, right? It's like <laughs> there's very, very yeah. – there are outcomes. Exactly. The, the Alexander Hernandez fight is a very, very telling tale of – what can go wrong in a breed in round two prop? But uh, I will be playing the breed in round two prop because five minute fighter, bro. Two and a half minutes of being like a top 10 fighter. And then it, it just trickles down. It slopes like the, the gradient curve just goes, woo. It, yeah, it gets really ugly, particularly after five minutes. Uh, all right, we got Francis Marshall taking on Isaac Dolgarian. Minus 160 for Marshall, plus 140 for Dolgarian. Who you got? Yeah, like I feel like Dolgarian could be okay down the road. I just don't know that I've seen enough of him yet. So, guy seems pretty solid. Uh, wrestled University of Nebraska, solid high school wrestler. Wrestles out of Nebraska. I, I would say he's very physically strong, got a decent base, but he smokes everybody early. Like his four fights as an amateur, he finished all four guys in the first round. Turns pro, he's five and zero. Oh, he's beaten all five guys in the first round. What's worrisome to me uh, as well is that, because, like, listen, he's undefeated as an amateur. He's undefeated as a pro. Of the eight combined fights between amateur and pro, all eight are first-round finishes. He's got a wrestling base, looks in sick shape. So all of that looks good, feels good, right? But keep in mind, this is a James Krause guy. This is a guy that was trained out of Glory MMA and Fitness, fought for James Krause's promotion, FAC, in Kansas, had hand tailor-made opponents given to him and look good against them the only notable win that he would have on paper is his last fight tj britain that fight took place a year and a half ago and uh i say notable because tj brighton's seven and two and i think he's four and as a pro boxer so that looks good he's 42 years old paul and he's a pro boxer he doesn't know how to wrestle he doesn't know how to grapple 
And he gets thrown in there against a college wrestler. So what the hell do you think is going to happen? So he smashes this guy. James Krause is in favorable position with the UFC at this point because this is a year and a half ago. So he has signed back then, and he pulls out of a fight with Daniel Arguetta due to injury. So he's actually low-key been signed to the UFC for like almost a year and a half. But he's had injuries. He's sat on the sideline. He's had to get a new gym. He's had to leave Gloria MMA Fitness. I believe he ended up at Factory X Muay Thai in Colorado. Great gym. Training partners on the card. Like, this is a guy that's amateur career and pro career feel a little bit rushed to me. Like, he's not seen a second round. He's not fought in great competition. He's not faced any type of adversity. You don't know about his cardio. You don't know about his durability. All of his other matches have pretty much been tailor-made to him and his game. Like, I don't like any of that. And then Francis Marshall, he's young, man. Like, he's 24. We got a 24-year-old Francis Marshall versus a 27-year-old um, Isaac. But, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like Francis is probably a little more mature in like fight years. Like he's a Kurt Pellegrino guy. His jiu-jitsu is okay. His wrestling is actually okay as well. And he's had a little bit of a fast and better level of competition. Two fights in the UFC. Debuts against, sorry, he fought on contender series against Connor Matthews. Not fighting out like six takedowns, 120 significant strikes. Look pretty solid, active, young kid, green in areas, but a work in progress, something that's going to get better. Second fight against Marcelo Rojo. He looked really good. It looked like this kid could actually turn out and be decent. And then they gave him a very, very, very strange fight with William Gomez. So William Gomez fights exclusively off his back foot. He's very, very lateral. He's actually pretty fast and quick-footed. It's a terrible fight. I think he had strikes in like 32 to 15. Francis Marshall can't find him. Nowhere to go. Pulls a bit of a third-round comeback out of his hat, but just it never materialized, and he ends up losing his first pro fight. I think that's good for him. Lose that O. Take that much stress off. Go back to the drawing board. Still only 24. Out of a fairly good camp. Good training partners. And you know, as, as far as Isaac bringing, you know, some solid wrestling to the table, I think Francis should be okay. If he gets taken down, he's got the jiu-jitsu advantage. He's got to work his way back up. But it's the fact that you know the kid can fight 15 minutes and still be active in the third round looking for a finish is stuff that you just haven't seen out of his opponent. So as much as Isaac Dolgarian is an athletic, good-based fighter that could potentially grow into something, I just feel like he's few years away from that francis marshall young also a few years away from that seemingly to me a little more advanced striking edge cardio edge durability edge experience edge enough for me to take that shot on francis marshall yeah i don't know what to really do with this one it's definitely not a fight that i'm going to be betting but based on the fact that at least marshall's been in the octagon i've seen him you know versus pro level fighters i mean maybe that's even a stretch because you know one of them is a contender series fight um and then rojo is like kind of bottom of the barrel and gomez was making his debut it's not it's not it's not all that impressive but i'll ever so slightly lean towards him to He's win just a buy yeah i mean dogarians fought like legitimate cab drivers basically up until um the one with TJ Britt, yeah, a, 40, a 41 year old dude um, that uh, he got a first round knockout against. But it's like, we, you know, we, there's so many questions about him. It's just like, well, what if, what if his opponent doesn't go away, right? If you don't go away in round one, we don't really know what, uh, what Delgarian's up to um, as this fight gets extended into round two, round three. Um, yeah, he's going to, I mean, all of his wins are first round finishes, correct? Yeah, I rarely, I rarely ever back guys like that, or at least not for significant money. I mean, I could see some argument in Dolgari. What's Dolgarian round one? Because maybe that's just him. Maybe he's just a one minute man. Um, just, just absolutely, just maybe he's our generation's Terrence McKinney, Cody. Um, Dolgarian round one plus four fifty. That's not the dumbest thing. That's not the dog. If someone's taking like those types of props, I don't hate it. But uh, Francis well, Marshall, yeah, Francis yeah. Marshall will also be the pick for me. What were you gonna say? Nothing. I was gonna say if you play fantasy type MMA where you need somebody for to some win type in round of one, yeah, for your to big score scoring. points for you, then yeah, yeah, right. A guy like that's got a proven track record of going for it. But oh, it's MMA, bro. Anything can happen. So yeah, you're not you're not off base. But I just I gotta I gotta roll with Marshall. And none of these fights, because we're not on the same page on three or four of these, but none of them feel like I would want to take the shoey bet on it, to be honest. I mean, we both picked Marshall there, didn't we? 
Oh, you are going to take him. Okay, okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were leaning towards. Blaine I don't Gary. know if it's your connection or maybe maybe gonna... my connection going back is uh, is all disjointed too. But uh, but no no, I said I was taking Marshall. Um, okay. There's just not okay. enough information to be perfectly honest from Dalgarian to lead me to believe. Like at least I've seen Francis go. I mean, it was a very very slow, tepid um, three rounds against Gomez. But it's like at least we got to kind of see that. I've seen his win over Rojo and I've seen Rojo go out there and put on some banger fights with some people. So it's like, it gives me, I have an idea as opposed to like Dolgarian. It's just like, I don't know who these guys are. They have like, like O and O records, O two and three records. And then the one guy of any sort of prominence that he fought is literally a 41 year old, what bantamweight or featherweight. I don't know. I, 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 that's why I was saying, it's like, if you were going to play the props game, wouldn't, wouldn't fault you for taking a shot on Dolgari in round one. Maybe that's just what he is. But I, uh, on the money line, I think the, the value is still on Francis Marshall. Two takedowns on, on Marshall for. See, it's like prize picks is tricky this week. There's a lot of like red flags for people. I'm trying to bring them. I'm trying to bring them up, but it's like I don't really love the board to be perfectly honest. It's like Marshall has like two takedowns. It's like ah, that could be a really good number or it could be a really dumb number. Like I don't know. I'm not too too confident in it. Uh, fight time, they've got listed at 11 minutes. Like I think that's pretty tight number too. Um, that's that. That's tight. It's it's very very tight. Moving on down, we've got Martin Budai taking on Josh Parisian. Budai a minus two hundred favorite. Parisian can be had for plus one seventy. Scraping the bottom of the heavyweight barrel here, Cody. But man, do I? Do, I don't know if you uh, you probably haven't been on Twitter much. Uh, I'm not nearly on as much anymore either, but. Have you seen like the the Josh Parisian like hype video where he's like elbowing this no. like he's elbowing like a, a bag? It's intense, bro. It's super well, I intense. I bet you it is. I, um, I bet. I bet. I mean, Party Marty probably. Yeah, Parisian just slows down so much. Uh, the, the gas tank has never really quite been there. Party Marty is at least like pretty strong at the weight class does pretty well holding guys up against the fence that seems to be how he wins a lot of his fights but man this is super super ugly i mean i'm not pulling the trick i'm not betting what's the over in this fight over two and a half rounds minus 125 Ooh, that's where i'm going <laughs> i don't mind that i don't mind that because obviously i love that outside of the lorenzo hood fight uh, Budai in the UFC hasn't really gotten a finish. Um, and Parisian always looks like he's going to die, but um, but he somehow somehow kind of holds on. Yeah, I mean, the official pick would be Budai by decision, but like it's going to be super, super ugly. Uh, Parisian just yeah, spends so much time off of his back. What, his wins against Baudo... Roque Martinez, Chad Johnson, and Greg Rebello. You know what all of those guys have in common, Cody? They don't have jobs in the UFC. Now, that's, that two of them didn't even ever get an opportunity outside of Contender Series. And then Roque and, and Alan Bodeau is like, come on. Come on. That is like the worst of the worst. Pogues went out there against Mick last time out and looked he got completely outclassed so you think about that it's like i actually think minus 200 is probably pretty fair on party marty party marty by decision what's the number on that probably shorter because the books are a little bit sharper these days than they used to be back in the day you would have had over one and a half uh marked at like minus 125 because they just thought heavyweights always finished but that is not the case particularly with a, du a dwindling heavyweight division. Plus 165 is out there right now. I think you could do worse than that. So, yeah, party Marty by volume, by holding up against the cage. Maybe get some takedowns if he wants to. I don't know if he even necessarily wants to. 56.5 significant strikes to the over. Don't hate it. Um, yeah, party Marty for me. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to agree. I think it's a terrible fight. I think it's going to go 20 
Sorry, it's going to go over two and a half. It's going to go the full 15 as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, it's just two middling heavyweights that like to lean on each other. Like Martin Budai on one hand, he's six foot four. He's a big old boy. And he doesn't actually really seemingly want to take his opponent down. He wants to pin them up against the cage, lean on them, and just land short shots. And that's what he does, fine and good. But yeah, like you said, outside of Lorenzo Hood, Lorenzo Hood's not good for the record. But outside of that one win inside the distance, his three UFC fights have all been bogs right up against the cage. Uh, Berchewski beat him up in the open field, but he leaned on him. And his last two performances, yeah, okay, not bad in terms of put up some numbers. But in terms of like the fight itself, just not not doing it for me, man. At the same time, though, he's young. He's got a somewhat effective a style that he's comfortable with. And a win over Jake Collier, to me, not bad. Jake Collier, I would say, is better than Josh Parisian. And so maybe he's trending in the right direction. Again, lands 92 significant strikes in that fight, controls most of the position, but it's a close fight. He just, he's in the advantageous positions for the most part. Um, looking at Josh Parisian, he's two and three in the UFC, but that Roque Martinez fight was a split decision that very easily could have been scored against him. He looked awful, 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 awful. And that's kind of his problem. His other, one other win is Alan Bodeau, which I'm sure you'll remember. He looked awful. He lost the first round to Alan Bodeau. In what world does that happen? Then he gets, you know, classic Alan Bodeau syndrome and he's able to put him away in the second. He's not looked confident. He's not looked all that good pretty much in any of these spots. His volume was good in the Parker Porter fight. Uh, but outside of that, it's just it's been weaning off. And then the biggest problem to me is gives up six takedowns to Dante Mays. Gives up four takes down his last time to Jamal Pogues. Like, even though uh, Martin Buda is not really trying to take guys down, like, if he wanted to get Parisian down, he would. And if he wants to just hold him up against the cage and control him, I think he can. And I think those short shots are going to work and be effective. But this thing's got heavyweight bog of a fight written all over it. Uh, I would say Budai. I would say Budai by decision. I would say the over two and a half. I would say the fight goes the distance. Um but it's also a super greasy, sloppy heavyweight fight. So, like, how much do you want to resource in Budai to get that done? So, anyways, I think he get, I, I think he wins. I really do. But uh, he's not the highest level, most trustworthy of guys. He could have lost his fight with Berchuski as well. Judges are bad. Judges are subjective. And when you're fighting these greasy decisions at a weight class like heavyweight, you're going to get screwed on a few of them. So... Just keep in mind that. Like, I don't know that I could top ticket Budai as much as I do think he does get the job done. All right. We got Jacqueline and Marim taking on my girl, Nectat. Uh, Jacqueline and Marim, minus 245 favorite. Nectat can be had for plus 210. I bet Nectat uh, plus 245 about a week ago. Um, the biggest question for me is, can Amarim stop a head and arm uh, throw, Cody? Because if she can't, She's going to get controlled on the ground. I mean, the Sam Hughes fight, it's like Amarim had her all sorts in all sorts of trouble in the first round, and then she gassed. It's just like, uh, if you're not getting those first round arm bars, first round knee bars, you got to be willing, you got to be able to uh, to go at least the full 15 minutes in the women's strawweight division. Like, being able to fight 15 minutes is paramount in the 115-pound division. I mean, haven't seen Montserrat Ruiz, obviously, since she got knocked out by Lamash, but she was getting, like, thrown to the slaughter there. Um, she's got one trick, and she's effective at it, but she's had two years off now. Maybe she's rounded out that skill set a little bit. Um, I don't know. The CF dot model told me. I mean, I, I kind of saw the number, and I was just like, that's probably going to be tighter on fight night it was like a half size bet for like what i do on like most of my other ones um but i couldn't i couldn't if she comes away triumphant i i couldn't let her do it alone so uh montserrat montserrat ruiz for me what about you i had to go with hammer in simple case you got a brazilian jiu-jitsu champion high level brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt versus somebody who relies on the head and arm tr uh, throw and gives up their back so two year long layoff, seemingly a one trick pony. I I did end up going Amarim to just give her those spots, but Monster Ruiz is very physically strong. She's very rugged. The two years off, she's only thirty years old. It's not crazy to think that spending time at Tenth Planet um, or Kings MMA has probably got her much improved. And again, physically strong. 
If she can keep Amram standing, if she can box her up, she can push her back and kind of be aggressive. Amram probably does tire and fatigue. But if she just comes out here and does what she always does, which is that head and arm throw, I got a feeling it actually gets her back taken here and puts her in trouble. So I'll go Amarim, but not a, not a whole lot of confidence there. All right, we got Demond Blackshear taking on Jose Johnson. Minus 180 for Blackshear, plus 155 for Johnson. Who you got here? I'm going to go with Demond Blackshear. So he's uh, oh, one and one in the UFC. He's yet to pick up his first victory, but I think that there's some decent enough stuff to like about him. In his debut against Yusuf Zalal, he won the first two rounds and super short notice as well. Unfortunately, it was a bad third. Um, fight ends up being ruled a draw, but he actually did a lot of good work in that fight. And I think that he's somebody that can strike, decent and decent striking, moves well, okay footwork. Um, and when he does get takedowns, he's got some decent top game. Like He'll throw down a lot of strikes, he'll, he'll look for submissions, he'll look to maintain position, and he's not exactly the easiest guy to buck off of him. But to fight Yusuf Zalal, on relatively short notice as a debut, tough fight. He was a fairly sized underdog. He got a draw out of it. They didn't do him no favors. They really didn't do him no favors his next time out against Basharat, one of the top prospects of the division. But again, you see Blackshear stick with it the whole time out. Present some problems here and there for Basharat. Obviously, he's just not that level of, you know, competitor. Jose Johnson, meanwhile, Jose Johnson, super well-traveled, had a long amateur career, has had a long pro career, either gets smoked out of there early in fights or ends up hanging around and giving people a lot of problems. But his takedown defense is a massive issue. He gives up multiple takedowns in all of his fights, wins or lose. I mean, maybe he subs you off his back, but he gives up a lot of takedowns. And when I see Damon Blackshear, when he ends up on top, he does a pretty good job of kind of avoiding everything that gets thrown up his way, maintaining top, and then landing some decent ground and pound, doing some damage, and it looks good for the judges. So I think if he goes out there, he's got enough striking to hang with Jose Johnson. He's got enough power to knock Jose Johnson out. But the main thing is the striking's not, not a huge differential. He'll be within himself standing. It's the ability to mix in those takedowns and have a lot of success from the top that hopefully crews Demond Blackshear for his first UFC win. But Jose Johnson's scrappy. He's well-traveled. He's a veteran-type guy. And he's dangerous. When he finishes, his win condition is generally inside the distance. But Blackshear has gone the distance with better guys than this. And so, again, get out of those sticky situations. Make him work. Put a beating on him. Win your first UFC fight. I think he gets it done. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. Like, really, really short notice. Jose Johnson coming in here. Uh, Blackshear was supposed to take on Brady High stand. And then, like, early action has been on Jose Johnson, but it's, like, after Blackshear's last fight against Luan Lacerda, who's, like, a decent prospect, I actually, like, because, like, when I made the boards on Tuesday night, I had, like, slotted in, like, I'm like, what, what's his number going to be? And I kind of took a guess of, I wrote minus 300, but I was thinking it was going to be, like, minus 250, minus 275. And then, you know, that it seems relatively playable. I think he showed that he's making lots of improvements and uh and like his grappling super super solid if the cardio can hold up over the course of three rounds we saw the best yeah he was the best version of him last time out like he absolutely dog walked uh luan lacerda um it was kind of surprising so i'm surprised that like all, all the early actions coming in on jose johnson i'm gonna have to look more i guess maybe into jose johnson but the pick uh, for the purposes of this show, will be Damon Blackshear with you. And finally, we got Luana Santos taking on Juliana Miller. Minus 160 for Santos, plus 140 for Miller. Um, watch tape on uh, Luana Santos. I like what I saw. She has, like, nice takedowns. She's a judo black belt. Um, that, that submission that she landed twice. Now it was against lower, low level competition. I've never seen it in the UFC for, cause it probably would never work, but what the Ke Keza Gatami leg Americana, she pulled that thing off twice. It's very strange. Like if you have some time to watch a little bit of tape, like it's a very, very strange setup, but I guess it works for her. But yeah, no, like I think her stand up game is definitely a massive work in progress. Um, but her entries to her takedowns looked super solid. And yeah, she's a black belt in BJJ or black belt, sorry, in, uh, in judo. Um, I think she can get to the fight to the mat. Juliana Miller's best part of her game has been her wrestling, but I'm not so convinced that she's going to have an edge here. So I can understand why, like when this opened up at like plus plus one ninety Santos, people pounded it immediately. And it's been continuing to grow. Cause I think, you know, they opened it up with the wrong fighter favored, and Miller, frankly, 
That performance against Veronica Hardy, getting taken down four times, not being able to really do anything, showing that she's three and two in MMA, very, very inexperienced. I know she's been working on it. She's she's growing as a fighter, but she showed some absolute massive holes in her game. And I think Luana Santos, from what I'd seen on tape in some of her fights, she's going to be able to find those takedowns as well. So Luana Santos, I think, is viable at minus 160 uh, here. I know you know you know me. You probably thought I was going to say CF dot, but I watched tape on this one, code. Yeah, I think you got to go with the tape, and the tape would suggest that Juliana Miller is not good at all. And I, I'm a big fan of her work. Don't get me wrong, but like no physicality. You mentioned the best part of her games are wrestling. Her wrestling's awful. Uh, her jiu-jitsu is pretty good. She creates scrambles. She'll go for different submissions. She's got really good cardio. She's got good durability. Good cardio. Absolutely a fighter at heart, scrappy, and some good opportunistic submissions and grappling. But the striking is not there. The wrestling is not there. And she just seems so not with it, you know? Like, she's just kind of in her own headspace. Thinks that she's a world champion. Thinks that she can beat some of the best girls in the world. And that last fight with Veronica Hardy, Veronica Macedo, whatever you want to refer to as. Super humbling, man. She got taken down. She got beat up. She got beat up standing. Her submissions were non-existent. And she was a sizable favorite coming off a win on the Ultimate Fighter to get crowned that season as champion. So I don't know. She's still young. She's still green, making improvements. But it's a lot to get thrown in there against veterans of the division. And I'm not saying by any stretch that Luana Santos is a veteran of the division. She's 23 years old, making a UFC debut. But yeah, she's kind of been in there with some decent competition. Striking, both of them are not super comfortable and considered strikers, but I would say Santos is the better of the two. If this fight was to stay a kickboxing match for 15 minutes, I think Santos would win it. Miller makes to me that needs to make it a grappling match. Now, how does she do that? Implement that wrestling. But as you said, the judo black belt from Santos, I don't know if getting her down is going to be all that easy. And even if you did manage to get her down, doing something with it is also going to be a problem. You'll see with Luana Santos, her only pro loss is to Jenna Bishop by split decision. Jenna Bishop is 5-0 in MMA. Yeah. She's 4-0 in LFA. She's 1-0 in Bellator. And she's also a no-gi jiu-jitsu world champion as a black belt. So she's really not good. Loss. So, yeah, that's not a bad loss at all. And she was able to get into bad spots, get her grappled. I, I totally understand why she lost that fight. But survive, and she's like 20 one years old when she fought her so to get a little more mature to get a little bit better to add some wrinkles to your game all good stuff i would like to see this closer to even being that it's probably a closer to even fight but yeah yes he is the pick so even though i gotta pay some steam on it it's just i, I gotta i gotta do it yeah you missed the number you missed the number i missed the i missed the number exactly well we record this on the wednesday so by the time we brings it to the people the, the number is gone. Correct. I missed the number too because I didn't watch tape yeah. until yesterday. Yeah, until Tuesday. And by the time I watched tape, I was like, I was watching and being like, wow, this person's making their debut. I'm like, maybe I'll find something here. I'm like, I actually kind of think this. I think if she was on the Ultimate Fighter, Luana Santos would have also, like, Luana Santos would have won that season of the Ultimate Fighter if she was on it. So um, it is what it is. Um, she beat Brogan Walker, right? Yeah. And then Brogan Walker ended up going to fight uh, Lucindo and getting, you know, more or less Molly smoked. Walked. Looking at that season, absolutely Molly walked. And then they were the only two girls from that season that even got finished on the, uh, that got featured on the Ultimate Fighter finale. I don't think one other girl made it. I would have to look, but I don't think, I think it was just a very weak season. She picks up a win, she's got a personality. And I'm telling everybody how, like, ah, you know, check her out. Killer Miller, you know, she's got a fun persona. And then I seen at the press conference, and it's just like, oh, man, she's delusional. And delusion is a really bad thing to have when you're a cage fighter. So maybe she's learned the loss, I think, again, humbling. Puts her back to the drawing board. But they didn't do her no favors giving her Santos. We'll see how it plays out. Let's face it, bro. The ultimate fighter is dead, right? Like it is dead. Like, why would you go on the Ultimate Fighter? Why would you spend three months in a freaking house having to fight like three or four times? And you know, Dana will get on his high horse and be like, "Oh, it's created all these great champions and stuff." It's like hasn't done that for a long time because they have like people have like decent managers now, and they're like, "Why would you take that risk going into that house having to fight that many times when it's like you can have one contender series fight or even more?" It's like. If you're a elite, elite prospect these days, the UFC signs you before having to go on Contender Series, before having to go 
into other situations so that they don't lose you to PFL or Bellator or they don't lose you to Japan or any of the other organizations. So the people who end up on the Ultimate Fighter. So you saw like all of the all the vets absolutely start the rookies yeah. this year, right? It's like these are all guys that was like they had like real middling career. outside of like Timur Valiev, who had a half decent career, but it's like most of them had very, very up and down middling careers in the in the UFC on their first run through. And they absolutely starched all of these guys that are, you know, the up and comers and stuff. Why? Because the best prospects aren't going to take that risk. They don't have to take that risk in the modern day of MMA. That's my opinion. I mean, you do, you know, you, no, you, you do like uh, house shows and, and that type of stuff. So you're way more in tune with it. But like, that's kind of how I look at it. It's like if I was a high end prospect, it was like Bo Nickel, who it's like they clearly already had a deal with Bo Nickel that he was going to sign with the UFC. And then they just kind of used, um, you know, contender series twice just to kind of, uh, he needed warm up fights anyway. So it might as well get more people to buy this, but uh, yeah, it's like high end, high end prospects. Like they don't have to go through any of that BS anymore. And you're seeing it with the ultimate fighter kind of flaming out. Yeah. So to that point, I just brought the season up, uh, but yeah, it was Hannah guy, uh, a fan of Bellator veteran, Brogan Walker Sanchez, a journeyman who actually just ended up losing the only other fight she had in the UFC, Kate Catherine Paprocki, Helen Peralta, who just lost as a minus 600 favorite on a Bellator card, Caitlin Neal, Claire Guthrie is another Invicta FC veteran. None of these girls, other than the two finalists, made it to the UFC. Both of them lost their next fight in the UFC. And yeah, it's definitely just. It, it's the ultimate fighter. Why would you put yourself through that? Because you're not going to get to the UFC otherwise. So why not jump on there and make something happen? So whatever. It's a fist fight at the end of the day. And Miller's a scrapper. She's definitely a fighter at heart. She's definitely going to fight for your dollar, but it's going to not be the prettiest attempt at saving you money. So uh, can't, can't get, can't get with her. Yeah. I didn't watch that season of the ultimate fighter. I'd probably wa rather watch power slap. Um, let's see here. What power we got? slap on the power slap slap. I mean, that's, that's not my thing, man. Not a power slap guy. It seems really low. And it's like when I, I saw that like Nevada, like that they, they, you know, they suspended a whole bunch of dudes from that. It's just like, I feel like you need to free base meth if you want to get slapped in the face. Like, uh, or like basically you're just inviting a concussion. Anytime you step in there, like that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And I, and I judge people when I see them like being like, I'm a big fan of it. So people in the comment section, if you're a fan, I'm judging you. Are you a fan, Cody? Power slap. I can honestly say I've never seen it. Well, I've seen like maybe a clips popped up in my social media, but they'll only ever show you just the KO. And like it's uh I wouldn't say like sickening, like I'm not like super moral high ground police. What are you doing, man? Like I'm a I'm a fight fan, man. I'm a yeah. passionate fight fan. But like I yeah, I'd like to see uh trying to defend like yourself, man. Yeah, I know that that's my thing. The the act of getting like knocked out, pretty heavy duty. And people don't realize that you can only get knocked out so many times in your life before your quality of life severely changes. So when you see a mad drag out fist fight and someone gets knocked out, it's just like, oh damn. But you're just you're just handing out free KOs on this show. Like, imagine you were like a five season veteran. Like, you're supposed to get KO'd. For, I don't know. I just I hope no one seriously gets hurt. But they're all guys that couldn't make it in other sports. I I'll admit it's kind of funny how they got like all nicknames. Like none of them go by their real names, probably because they don't want anybody to know what they're up to. <laughs> but uh, but they all got like these like little you know nicknames or personas. And I guess it's kind of funny. You got to sell it the best you can, but. Uh, yeah, why would I just want to watch someone purposely run a car into a wall? Well, it's like a NASCAR, right? If they just ran the car into the wall, it's not really all that fun. But like no. trying to maneuver it around the track at those kind of speeds and then drifting out and smoking the wall. Yeah, as long as no one dies. Good exactly. time, right? That's, bad. That's a very good analogy, to be perfectly honest. It's a, yeah, car driving directly into the wall. It's like MMA has similar components. Like you could eat a Francis Ngannou overhand right or an uppercut and just like, you know, Alistair Overeem. It's like that was a very, very damaging uh, knockout that he took there. It's like it's similar to like what you see in like 
power slap, but it's like the and, and or uh, France or uh, Alistair Overeem was actually like a professional who had been around the block for so many years, and it's like it was kind of impressive. I, I mean, he had been knocked out a whole bunch of times, but at least like you know he he had some very very credible wins in his career, and he's trying not to end up in that situation. So it's like there's a little bit of there's it seems a lot more skilled, and I'm sure. Being able to power slap the, you know, power slap the hell out of somebody. There are skills to it, but I don't know. If your daughter, Cody, comes to you and was just like, Dad, screw college. I want to be a power slapper. Like, you're disowning that kid on the spot. She is not getting, yeah, inheritance or anything like that. Like, tell me, tell me I'm wrong. I, I thought you were going to say if she came home and said, this is my boyfriend, Brad, he's a power slapper. Like, <laughs> or they'd be like, this is my boyfriend. This is my boyfriend, Mammoth. He's a power slapper. Like, this, this is not American Gladiator, dog. Your name's Steve. Anyways, I'll uh, jump. Before you even said that, what I was honestly thinking in my mind as you were talking was, imagine, like, you know, you're a you're a boxing champion. You're you know old now. You're in your sixties, and you got your grandchildren sitting on your lap, and it's just like, yeah, oh yeah, this is when I beat that guy's ass over eight rounds in Puerto Rico. That's bad ass. Mm -hmm. You know, oh geez, you're a cage fighter. Well, you know, Grampy was a world champion. Oh, there was that yeah, time I slammed that dude on his neck, broke his C four and C five vertebrae, and took him out. Pretty badass. Mm -hmm. If you're like, there was that time I. Slapped <laughs> Hillroy in the face, like oh, he was just man. standing there, willing to take it, and just like, well, I don't know, man. Did he like, move, there's... Grampy? <laughs> no, he wouldn't move him before, and he wouldn't move him after. His Grampy took him out. He's... Like, not that cool, dude. Not that. Cool. They're all brain dead now. Like, I don't know, man. It's not for me. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I see like some of like you know the talking heads that promote it and stuff, and I think it's a little bit shameful, but. They'll, they're just willing to say anything for money. Um, let's quickly uh, hey, let's uh, move on down People to People used our... to talk about that about MMA, though. So I just want to say that yeah. even if you're a power slap fan, you're like, these guys are jerk offs. You're okay to believe that because people used to have the same conversation about MMA. Oh, it's human cock fighting. Oh, these people are just getting killed. Oh, I don't want to watch someone get taken down and stomped in the face. Um, but, dude, it turns out it's badass. So I doubt in 20 years I'm a power slap fan. But uh, MMA is badass. I, I, can't, I can't say anything against that. And yeah. the people that were saying it wasn't, they was wrong. So hopefully uh, when I'm older, it's like, oh, you just don't like stuff because it's new. And and it's, what's that Abe Simpson quote? It's like, uh, you're not with it, old man. He's like, I used to be with it. But then they changed what, what it, it was. And now what it is, I'm not. His and slap. what it is, I find scary. Yeah, it's, it, dude, that's exactly it. It's like, I find MMA cool. I find boxing cool. Power slap, not cool at all. They're going to come up with something after power slap. I'll think that's even worse. Like, maybe I'm just uh, becoming an old scene. My old man, Paul. I don't think power slap is as big as, like, the powers that be try to make us seem it is. The number of views on Rumble. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's bigger than I think, but it's like, I haven't met like a single person on the street. It's just like, did you watch power slap us? That's a lie. There's actually one guy that I know who lives out here that, wa that watched it for a bit. But I think even he, like after the initial like shock and awe is like stopped watching. Um, I don't know if it's going to last, man. I don't know. But, you know, there's plenty of people, as you were saying many years ago, said that UFC wouldn't last and. Here we are for what four or seven seven years doing a podcast every single week. So, all right, uh... it's been nine years. I think we started in uh, 2014. Um, I will leave you with this. I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm going to get out. Of, I'm going to give you the PRP, and then I'm out of here. But uh, I said last week, if you found me in Nashville, I'd do a shoey for you, right? One guy, one guy did find me. UFC betting boss. His handles a uh, MMA DraftKings God. Like really good dude, man. Came from Missouri with his wife. Got four kids. They had like a couple's getaway weekend. And like I'm really, I'm really glad he came down. The deal was, if you catch me, I would do a shoey for you. Problem is, is he caught me on the Thursday or the Friday at uh, the Nashville Underground show. So, like, he caught me right before I had to go on commentating duties for the main card. Problem number one, I was right about to jump on the sticks. Can't do a shoey. Problem number two, I was wearing flip-flops. So, also can't do a shoey. 
So you're talking about bad ideas, right? Well, bad idea is, is slap fight. But I'm going to show you a bad idea right here, okay? The first time this has ever been done, and I'm hoping the last time this will ever be done. This is a floppy, Paul, because UFC bad God, he found me. I have no idea if this is going to work, Paul. This seems like a horrible idea. This is this is the power slap of Shoeys. It's called a floppy. And this is probably going to be a sloppy floppy. It's going to be very sloppy. Ha have some self-respect. Get yourself some children's rain boots, my man. Come on. Seems like it's going okay. Uh, yeah, but it's just getting all over me. All right, I'll just pound the rest of the beer like real man. A floppy. Was that suggested? Because that just seems like a yeah, perfect way to just waste perfectly good, uh, good perfectly good boosts. All right, quickly before you do your PRP. I like Blackshare. I haven't bet it yet. It worked better than I. Um, I bet. Uh... Uh, Montserrat Ruiz at plus 245. Chris Dawkins at plus 184. Maybe it was plus 182. We're splitting hairs at this point. Interested in Dawkins sub, Frem sub, and Breeden two. Um, Breeden round two, that is. Uh, prize picks br uh, Martin Budai over 56.5 significant strikes. And Lucindo under two takedowns. Those are my favorite two. Honestly, it's pretty slim pickings out there on prize picks, or at least I'm not too confident in many spots on the board this week. Cody, if you're all fixed up from your uh, from your floppy there, uh, hit him with the PRP. Yeah, well, never make a promise that you'll do a shoe when you see somebody, and then we're flip flops around. So I robbed him from his right to see the floppy right then and there, but I had like a paid gig coming up, and like, dude, Aljamain Sterling was right next to me. Oh, dude, Marab Dabashvili, really good guy. Uh, tiny, tiny little man could make 125 pounds. I'm very certain of that. Good dude, wearing a Hawaiian shirt, like floral pattern, wearing his little fedora, mingling it up with the fans. Went over and talked to him quickly. Good dude, Aljamain Sterling, the champ. Not that big, not that big. Matt Frivola, gigantic. My god, the difference between 55 and 35, I guess. Anyways. I robbed him was right of seeing the floppy right then and there. So I had to make it right. I waited at the end of the show because I didn't want to give. He was a hardcore fight fan. He was he was one of our guys. He'd been watching our show for years. He was a true supporter and he made the effort to come down. Not that enough. was really badass. That was like the most humbling thing of the whole thing. So 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 I, I had to give him one. So anyways, shout out to my brother. Shout out to all the fans. And if you listen this far in the show, you're a hardcore fight fan. You got that little nugget. Did it go as good as I expected it to go? No. Would I attempt it someday in the future? Probably not. However, it was the floppy. Jumping over to the PRP. This PRP is going to be greasy as hell. It's going to be hard to hit. There's going to be a lot of good plus money on it. If you were to pull something off, even if it was just a six line or like a three liner, six picks, it's going to pay quite well. But we're going with PRP this week. Vincente Luque, dog number one. I'm going to take Hakeem Dewadu. That could sometime change, but I think the smart pick would just be bite it down and go Dewadu. I'm going to go with Khalil Roundtree. I'm going to go with Yasmin Yusindo. I'm going to go with AJ Dobson as dog number two. Josh Frem, Marcus McGee, Mike Breed in dog number three, Francis Marshall, Martin Budai, Damon Blackshear, Jacqueline Amarim, and Luana Santos. So, yeah, three underdogs on 13 fights doesn't really seem like it's going to get the job done. I could see some of those other ones jumping through. It's all about just figuring out what your safest bets are. Bellator looks like it's got some a few safer picks on it. So maybe try to attack it from like a Bellator and UFC cross promotional parlay standpoint. Um, but again, the research has been done. We just got to hope that fighters show up, make weight, feel good, perform the way we believe that they can. Hundred Hundo P. All right. That is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show for producer Megan and Cody Saptic. I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh.